Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my 2022-2023 Conference Championship Weekend predictions. Well, it's amazing. We have played 270... Uh, 281 games through this 2022-2023 NFL season. And we are down to the final three games of the year. It's uh, quite hard to believe, actually, that we're at this point. It's kind of sad, too. You know, the games are getting higher and higher stakes. We only got three more to go. It's Conference Championship Weekend. But we are here, the final four. And for the Fanatic in Conference, uh, in Divisional Round Weekend, I did better. Um, I still remained 500 against the spread. I went 2-2 two two against the spread. But straight up, though, I had a 3 and one week. Uh, Buffalo let me down tremendously. They lost 27-10 in a fairly easy and decisive victory against the since uh, against the Buffalo Bills. Since beat them 27-10, uh, Joe Burrow threw, I believe, 200, a little over 240 yards and two touchdowns. Had a very clean game. He now has the second most postseason victories for a quarterback in his first three seasons. I believe only Russell Wilson has more at six wins. Through his first three years. And another fun fact. The Cincinnati Bengals entering this coming season. Had only won five postseason games as a franchise. Entering the last two years. Joe Burrow through his two years. As the Cincinnati. Or in two of his three years. As the Bengals starting quarterback. Has just as many postseason victories. Than the entire franchise did entering 2020. That is, or 2021. That is downright amazing. He is the greatest quarterback that Bengals franchise has ever had. And I know Boomer won an MVP. And I know Ken Anderson got to one as well. But Joe Burrow, by far, clearly, is the best quarterback they have ever had. And it's not even close. Um, I thought they had a fantastic game. They, he entered that game having three backup offensive linemen. Uh, their left tackle, their right guard, and their right tackle were out for the game. Jonah Williams, Alex Kappa, and Lyle Collins were all out for the game. I believe the, I forget who the one guard was, but Ted Karras, who apparently got nicked in the game. Uh, that, was, that was the only starting lineman they had from the beginning of the year. And he played a very quick, very decisive passing game. And Joe Nixon had over 100 yards, which I think for him was his second 100-yard game this season. Which is incredibly impressive. You know, for him. And I thought that Bengals offensive line, they may want to keep those guys moving forward because the other guys on that line were not doing that well. <clears throat> Arguably besides Collins. Definitely Jonah Williams, who had given up the most sacks in the league this year with left tackle. Um, was definitely not doing well enough, to, I feel like, to keep his job. So whoever they had at that left tackle spot, if he plays well enough next week, I would argue there should be a competition going into next year for that spot moving forward. No offense, Jonah, but he played that badly, so... Uh, so that was my only loss straight up against the spread. I went 0-2 the first day, um, and I went 2-0 two, two the next. Uh, you know, so I'll, I'll take that, and straight up I went 3-1. and one. So overall for the postseason now, through 10 games, I am 4-6 and six against the spread. But you can flip that straight up. I am 6-4 and four straight up. Um, you know, I've had two really bad losses straight up. <coughs> Cincinnati, Buffalo, and Tampa Bay, Dallas. The other ones, eh. The other two were one, a seven-point game and a 27-point collapse from the Chargers. But since we were already at the Conference Championship weekend, they haven't been there in a while. I don't even talk about it anymore, but we know that story. And against the spread, kind of some tough luck there. Again, uh, I took the Chiefs minus eight and a half. They had a 10-point lead after they got a field goal to go up. Uh, it was like 28, like 18, you know. And then a fourth, or it was 27-17. Uh, the Jags got the backdoor cover with the Riley Patterson field goal at the end of the game, which sucked. But, you know, so that ruined that one. The Giants-Eagles, absolute annihilation from the Philadelphia Eagles to the New York Giants, 38-7. to That was a game that I clearly got wrong from the jump. The Eagles looked fresh. They ran the ball incredibly well. I think they had over, like, a, over 180 yards rushing. Jalen threw another two touchdowns. It was the cleanest game. They had their largest margin of victory for any division rivalry series that goes three games since I believe it's in 1929. 
when the uh, when the Giants, a different iteration of the Giants, beat another team, uh, but 1929, because I think they won by 63 points combined. So that you know that tells you how great this Eagles team has been against that Giants team. The Giants have nothing to be ashamed about, personally. But the Giants, they played, they had a heck of a year. Overshot their expectations by leaps and bounds. You know, getting a 9-7-1 record. Getting Daniel Jones a playoff victory. First playoff win they've had since 2011. The last time they went to the Super Bowl. You know, do they have a lot of work to do? Yes, they do. Because, honestly, I felt like when Dayball went for it and failed on that 4th and 8, like, that basically ended the game. You know, I, I'm not saying that, you know, if he went for it there and tried to move forward, that, you know, if he punted it, that would have changed the outcome. It probably wouldn't have. But basically, at that point, when they were up 14 nothing, it just snowballed completely out of control after that one. Kudos to James Bradbury, the team that cut him last year. He gets a pick on him in the playoff game. Um, and Daniel Jones, for the second time this season, didn't have a touchdown, which was huge. And, you know, that's the thing. I think the Giants they have a lot of big free agents in their offensive cores. Dan Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, and uh, Sterling Shepard are the big offensive names uh, that they have free agent-wise. Uh, Fabian Moreau, uh, what is probably their big defensive free agent name. But I think the Giants, if they can use their money properly... And spend it properly. And I have to commend Saquon Barkley for saying this. He did say that he will not break the bank for the Giants uh, in this offseason. So that is, that is great news to hear if you're a Giants fan. Because that will at least show that, you know, they can move forward in a uh, better direction. And it, it, that he may not have to, they're not, it's not going to ask to reset the market. Which is huge for a player saying that in a contract situation in the league, you know, now. So, um, the, there was that game. Talked about Bills, Bills, Bengals, and Chiefs, uh, Jags. So kudos to the Jags, too. Heck of a year. You know, went on a six-game win streak to get to this point. Played overall fairly well. William Lawrence had his moments where he had some great throws. <clears throat> and Christian Kirk did drop one, by the way. Um, that could have been a big play. I, I didn't understand what Collinsworth said. That was a bad throw. Now, no, Kirk could have caught that one. But William Lawrence showing in his second year, showing in his youth, that he still, you know, can make some very bad mistakes. And they had a costly fumble at the end, which iced the game. You know, again, I do think for the Jags, though. And for any Jags fans out there to watch this. You are having William Trevor Lawrence. Having William Lawrence. And Doug Peterson. They are the new manning Dunchy combo in the AFC South moving forward. Because the rest of that division is in a very bad spot. I look at the rest of that division and go... There is no optimism, and there's no optimism with duo or talent that you feel like moving forward that they're going to be able to win that division. This is the Jags division. This is Duval's County's division, I believe, moving forward for at least the next five seasons. Maybe longer than that. But I will say this right now, and it's, you know, five years on the road, I believe the Jags will win the division five consecutive years, I guess, regard minus injury. That's how confident I believe in this Jags team and how bad I think the AFC South is remaining as a whole. That Jags team should win the division for the next five seasons. I think they are that good. They are that position well with the coaching, the talent, the quarterback, better than every other team in that division moving forward. So. And then lastly, I'll talk about the Cowboys-Niners game. That was a very awkward or very interesting game. It was a gritty, tough defensive game. I got to give Dan Quinn his credit. He did a very good job uh, posting up a very good defensive game plan for the 49ers. They were held to 19 points, and Brock Purdy, for the first time in his NFL career, did not throw a touchdown. But he played well enough. He made some very key decisions. Robbie Gold, still perfect in his postseason career. Uh, which is incredibly impressive. Um, and he came out clutch with a big 50-yard field goal to give them the lead and then the nice chip shot to give them the 7-point lead, which ended the game. But the Niners, again, just played a tough, physical brand of football. They really shut down the running game from Pollard and Zeke. Uh, and uh, Also, my thoughts are out to Tony Pollard. Uh, he fractured his fibula, and he will be... He, he, that was the last game he played. But he is now out, for the, I believe, for the next two to three months due to that injury. That's the usual time that injury lasts. And uh, <clears throat> I really genuinely believe that for the Cowboys, they are, but I would say they're stuck. And I feel like for a lot of teams this postseason, that's what I feel like they're kind of in the position now of. 
That, like, you look at the Vikings. They're stuck. You look at the Cowboys. They're stuck. And I, I and I, and this might be a hot take to some people, but I genuinely believe it. I am a Josh Allen fan. I, I, I love his tight, his talent, his ability at times. But he just, he just also makes just some very bad decisions, awkward decisions that make, you know, use sound lyrics that make you say, hmm, you know. And I feel like the Bills, they are stuck with Josh Allen, the quarterback. Because, you know, and, and that's the problem. Like, with those three teams, like, they have good enough talent. They'll win a bunch of games. But you're getting to the point to where with the Vikings, <clears throat> even though they made the playoffs for the first time in a couple years, or definitely the Bills. The Bills are at that worst point of stagnation to where I honestly don't think for people, they care. I would tell people, I don't think any non-Bills fans out there, they're not going to care what the Bills do this next regular season. They could win 11, 12, 13, 14 games in the regular season. They could clearly win the AFC East, but they should be favorites again this, this upcoming season. But nobody's going to give a flying rip until you reach those January games and when the, when they matter. They'll start caring about the Bills at that point. And that's a horrible feeling to have. Because it just means like you just play all those regular season games. You can put up all the regular season stats you want. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about that at, at a certain point. It's fun. But if you're not winning postseason games as often. And for Sean McDermott, if you're just getting into the divisional round. If you're going to be the semifinalist year after year after year. You know or the bronze medalist every year, you know, being the Alfred of the AFC, that's that's great. You're part of the big cast of Batman, but you're not Batman or Robin. You're Alfred. You're just a butler. That you gets the whole that you know that Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow have Josh Allen's you know quarterback hood on a plate there. They just keep there because that's what I feel like for those two. They they have clearly ascended above him. So, um, you know, so I think that's. You know, going to be an interesting point there. But I feel like also for the Cowboys, again, they're stuck. Like, they got, they have Dax getting $31 million fully guaranteed next year. He's going to be in a spot to where, you know, he's entering the final few years of his contract. But do you, you know, can you get to the championship game without, you know, with Dak Prescott? Probably not. You know, we think the Niners are still going to be great. The Eagles are still going to be great. Uh, the Rams should be better. And there's all these other teams that you feel better about the rosters and the construction compared to what uh, the Cowboys have, you know, moving forward. And they're going to have to try to pay Trayvon Diggs this year, which I think will be a big big problem. <clears throat> or a big problem after next year if he's going into his contract year without any, you know, without a contract. So, um, and also I want to give one more quick shout out to Brock Purdy. Um, 8-0 eight and, eight and as a starter, or 7-0 and as a full-time starter, won the game against the Dolphins where he should have been credited with a win, but Jimmy got that one. But, has not lost a start, played very good football, and I would tell every Eagles fan out there that watch this show, I know a few personally, you know, I, I would tell every Eagles fan out there, do not sleep on the San Francisco 49ers. This is the best team the Eagles will have played the entire season. They went into Philadelphia last year and with Jimmy and playing awkwardly. They won 27-20. They played a good enough game with Jimmy. This Niners defense has speed. They have great tacklers. They have a good enough sec. They have a very good pass rush. Lane Johnson's banged up. He's playing through an injury. He's playing through a torn abdomen. You know, they have a very good offensive line led by the silverback, Trent Williams. The best left tackle in football. They have Debo and Christian McCaffrey and Eliza Mitchell. They have better running back depth. They have a better tight end weapon than you do. They have good offensive schemes, and they have the confidence of saying... Um, that they know how to win a game on the road. And Kyle Shanahan has, you know, as much as I bang and clang on him in the regular season, he is one of the best postseason coaches the Niners have ever had. He actually surpassed Jim Harbaugh, who was the last great coach the Niners had, <clears throat> um, with six postseason victories in his sixth year. And to be fair, that is actually six postseason victories over three of the last four seasons. So... Uh, that is incredibly impressive, and I just would tell every Eagle fan, don't sleep on this 49ers roster, because I know everybody watched that game, and I saw some Eagles content creators, I follow, that, oh, this game is boring, and the Eagles are going to just roll through the Niners. I'm like, no, they're not. 
No, they are not. Brock Purdy is a good enough quarterback to do this. He is a good enough athlete to make some havoc happen. And I just think the not the Eagles history will tell you as well. Okay? The Eagles have blown plenty of conference championship games. They blew they blew two famous ones in 2002 and 2003. The more in 2002, the Buccaneers had never won a game where it was under 50 degrees. And they went into the link of they went into the link that day and or uh, the link or the vet, I that might have been the They went into the vet or the link that day and they beat them. And it was capped off of McNabb throwing that Rondé Barber intercept. The next year, where the Eagles again were clearly the better team than the Carolina Panthers. They played Jake Deloma the Panthers, and Donovan McNabb in that game threw three interceptions, which was the same amount of points the offense had scored. So and I'm not saying Jalen Hurts is going to have that bad of a performance. He's better than Donald McNabb. Clearly. But I just want to point that out. Is that the 49ers have the talent. They have the confidence. And they have the coaching to win this game. To win this game. So. Um, but, but, you know, those are my thoughts on all that. Let me get into my picks. Uh, I, actually, I did forget one thing. So let me. Tell you also, through 281 games, my overall record against the spread now is 135, 140, and 6. And straight up now, I am 174, 103, or 174, 105, and 2. So that equals up to 49.1% against the spread. And straight up, that equals 62.3% straight up. So definitely, I'm not going to reach my above 500, or by 500 or above mark against the spread. I had a really good chance, and there were moments this year that I had the 500 mark in my grasp. Or I was at 500, but then the Monday night game would play, and I would lose every Monday night. Every Monday game where I had a 500 record. I had a chance to go above it, and I fell. And then every freaking time. You know, but still a 49% against the spread percentage. I lose money, but I've gotten better at this. And I feel better about, you know, my confidence moving forward. And, like, you know, my goal next year is to be a 500 against the spread predictor. So, wish me luck. Hopefully, you know, I can learn, and I can understand these teams with more information. But we'll see. And straight up, 62.3%. That's good. You know, I'll take it. You know, it's definitely a little bit lower than I usually have. But, you know, how many crazy games there were and two ties. You know, I'll, I'll take that and just move forward with it. So, uh, there's that. So, time for my picks for Conference Championship Weekend. Uh, so, on Sunday, January 29th at 3 p.m., the NFC Championship game, when the San Francisco 49ers travel to Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Eagles are two and a half point favorites in this game. Give me the Philadelphia Eagles here to win straight up. And I know I just talked about all that stuff for Eagle fans. So, you know, I get all that. Uh, but I'm taking the Philadelphia Eagles here straight up. But I am taking San Francisco plus two and a half. <coughs> and then in the AFC Championship game at 630 on CBS and Par Paramount Plus, when the Cincinnati Bengals travel to Kansas City to play them for the fourth time in about a calendar year, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs are one point favorites in this game is and I know and I'll explain this more in de detail as all my head is telling me Cincinnati is going to get healthier they've had the number they don't have a quarterback that's banged up as Patrick Mahomes is who has suffered a high ankle sprain uh, I am going to go as much as my head's telling me that there's just something in my head telling me that this feels very much like Niners and Rams to where like if the Chiefs are ever going to get over this hurdle, it's got to be this game. Because then it, it, if, you know, and that's what I believe will happen. I think with this roster, with, you know, the confidence of knowing what's happened in the last few games, they will finally put it all together, I think, enough. Even with Mahomes' bum ankle, through that high ankle sprain, I believe they will put it all together enough to win this game. So that's why I can't sit here minus one. And Kansas City straight up. If this was a two and a half or three point spread, I probably would have gone with Cincinnati just like I did last time. Because again, I won't be surprised at all if the Bengals win this game. Actually, logic would tell you that the Bengals should win this game. But I'm going to take the Kansas City Chiefs here, uh, minus one, and Kansas City straight up. All right, so let me give you my thoughts on each game. The Philadelphia Eagles over the San Francisco 49ers. Um, I am taking the Philadelphia Eagles here based on the fact that they have the better quarterback. And that, this is what I always thought, is that, look, you know, you know, you look at the rosters and go, you know, the Eagles have the better offensive line. The Eagles have the better wide receiver depth. 
Uh, the Eagles have the better secondary. The front sevens are about a push. I think the Niners are better linebackers. All the rosters are about the same, pretty much. And the kicking, I would take, I would take Elliott for distance, but Robbie Gold is more proven experience, which I think is big. Um, but in a game like that, where you have the even rosters, you have to go with the quarterback. And as great as Brock Purdy has been, he has been on one of the great seven-game stretches that you could have as a starter, eight-game stretches as a starter. He's just not Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts this year will be second in MVP voting. He has, you know, played exceptionally well. 66%, you know, completion percentage. Uh, you know, tremendous passing and rushing touchdowns combined. Uh, he has been that good of a quarterback. And I feel like if he wins, and then wins in a couple weeks in Glendale, he will be, moving forward, the greatest quarterback the Eagles have ever had. And he will be the GOAT of the Eagle quarterbacks. Sorry, Nick Foles and McNabb and, and Jaws. There you're Mount Rushmore. There's your Mount Rushmore quarterbacks for there, for the Eagles. <clears throat> but I just didn't, I have to take Jalen over Brock. And this is one of those things to where, you know, I get it that, you know, everything else could tell you, you know, Kyle has been in this spot, but it feels very much the same that we're against a desperate team. You know, you know, I know, I know the Niners and Rams. Don't have that history. I just feel like in this spot, the way Brock played, because to be fair to the Dallas Cowboys, Dak had two interceptions. He should have had three with Dre Greenlaw, who had a pick six. That would end the game and giving you the cover easily. He had three interceptions. One to Bland, one to Diggs, and I, or one to Diggs on that last round. I forget, I forget the other one uh, that he almost threw. So, you know, look, he, he showed some weakness there. Again, near interceptions are not interceptions. They're near, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I trust that, you know, the Eagles defense should be able to do a good enough job on the receiving weapons. If they double Debo and double Kittle, I just make Brock Purdy use Jawan. Make Brock use Brandon Ayuk. Make Brock use Elijah, Mi Elijah Mitchell. And <clears throat> the Eagles pass rush, which led the league in sacks and had a first ever four men having 10 or 10, 10 or more sacks. First time in NFL history that you had four players on the same defense have 10 or ten or 11 plus sacks for each of them. Use that pass rush to cause Purdy to make some mistakes. He can maybe avoid one, but he just seemed like every time he did, he couldn't make the right decision or he had to be very rushed into a throw and cause with your receivers with Devontae and AJ attack the weakness of the 49ers defense which is their back end their back end is not bad but it is definitely the weakness of their group because definitely cd who had 10 receptions over 100 yards yesterday he definitely had his way with it and i think Devonte or aj one of them should be able to as well uh goddard i think will kind of be the interesting x factor in the middle of the field because the niners are going to try to hit in the hashes where the eagles should hit the outside and i just trust as well like in that type of running game I just trust Jalen and Sanders to do a little bit better of a running job compared to the Niners with McCaffrey and Purdy or McCaffrey, Purdy, and Mitchell. I know Debo can run too, and he may have a couple nice runs. <clears throat> but I am taking the Philadelphia Eagles here based on the fact that they have the better quarterback. Again, you know, if if Jalen struggles or he gets a couple turnovers or you know the Niners defense can cause as much havoc as it has the entire year, um, then yeah. Then the Niners, you know, can easily win this game. But I just think in this spot, when you have these two, you know, evenly matched teams in regards to, you know, having some advantages over others, coaching, I would give the Kyle Shanahan, even though Sirianni has done an incredible job this year, which nobody expected. Uh, I'm going to take the Philadelphia Eagles here, better quarterback at home. And I just think Hurts makes one or two more plays that Purdy doesn't. And I think Purdy makes one or two more mistakes or incompletions that cost the Niners this game. Which will mean for the third time, for the second straight year, they will have lost the conference championship game. I and I, from what I've heard, Brock Purdy is still going to be the quarterback for the Niners moving forward in 2023. I obviously think he, or I already think he's better than Trey Lance. I think ever will be, and I think Trey Lance probably be traded to the Tennessee Titans here eventually, uh, soon. But um, if I had my own personal opinion, if Brock Purdy loses this conference championship game, call the 45 year old man in a Florida home. 
Call that 45-year-old man. Tell him, come to San Francisco. You're the missing piece of this. You're the missing piece. We can win a Super Bowl with you here. You've played with this organization. Or you've idolized this organization since you were young. We, you know, And you, we want you to be in that group with Steve and Joe. This would be LeBron going to the Lakers. Or, you know, LeBron, LeBron James going to the organization that, you know, he loved, you know, or being one of the Immortals too, and putting his name on there and saying, you can end your career by, at home with your family by the bay if we can get this six champ, we can get our six championship, your eighth, and you can retire in the sunset. And we, then Brock Purdy, starting in 2024, can be the quarterback moving forward with already the eight starts under his belt or how many starts he has. And we can all, you know, move forward in a positive direction. So that's what I would do. But I, I know they're not going to do it. But that's what I would do if I were the Niners in the spot if they lose this game. So that's like Philadelphia here straight up. But San Francisco plus two and a half. And lastly, the Kansas City Chiefs over the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, and this is one to where I am just believing that for the Chiefs. Okay, because I know everything I just said in my head. It all goes towards the Bengals. Better receivers. Consistency. You know, Joe Burrow playing at a high level. The defensive schemes. Mahomes' ankle. I know it's all pointing towards Cincinnati. I just I just think for the Chiefs, they have to understand this is Niners-Rams. If, if this team loses to the Cincinnati Bengals, this is becoming Manning-Brady 2. Or the Manning-Brady of this current generation. And Joe Burrow is becoming Tom Brady at that point. Joe Burrow, you know, and I know a lot of people love comparing him to Brady due to, you know, his confidence. You know, I think he's basically very much the flip side of what Tom was coming out of the draft. But it's very much that sense of where Joe Burrow has this guy's number. This wonder kid that everybody thought when, when Andy drafted him with the 10th overall pick in the 17 draft and what he's been able to do for the past five seasons, two MVPs, Two Super Bowl appearances. The passing single season yardage record. Been absolutely dominant. Won every road game in his division throughout his career so far. Uh, you know, proving that he didn't, you know, he can, he doesn't need Tyree Kill and still can lead the league in passing. You know, doing all this stuff. Giving Travis Kelsey, you know, a GOAT aspect of a tight end conversation all time. Uh, it's, it, it's just crazy to me because it's just like, this is a guy that's, you know, not nearly as talented. Doesn't have nearly as much accolades at this point, but he's better. And it's just one of those things where you can't you can't ignore four straight times. You, you, you know, you could argue three. But if you're telling me in a calendar year, essentially, four years or four games in a year, two, two of them and splitting evenly, that you can't beat this guy? And remember, they already won the division already. So both of them are going to play each other again next year again for the fifth time. You know, in about two years. Five games in two years. And, you know, you are going to say that Joe Burrow is the best quarterback in the NFL if he wins. You know, or Joe Burrow is the best quarterback in the AFC if he wins. Because that's back-to-back Super Bowls. Well, just as many Super Bowl appearances as Patrick Mahomes. But, he, you know, and he did it back-to-back just like Mahomes did it back-to-back. But if he gets a win and then he wins Super Bowl against the Eagles and the Niners... Which would be, again, everybody says that in San Francisco, just due to history, 81-88. <clears throat> but that, that, that's just one of those moments where Joe Burrow becomes the king, the Tiger King. And I'm, I, I won't go into what, and I know all the stuff about the Tiger King. I heard Daryl Baskin, Daryl Baskin, that's still alive. I get that, and I saw that, but I'm not going to go into that. Cause we'll just, but the Tiger King and Joe Burrow, the Bengal Tiger King, he is the best quarterback in the NFL going into next year. And arguably moving forward for the next few years. And the Cincinnati Bengals will have to pay the largest contract they've ever had in franchise history. And as much as many people might think, you know, Joe Burrow will earn every single dollar and cent and cents by, you know, that decision. But I just think, like in this spot, the Chiefs know. They, you know, have had leads of 14, 8, you know, or 11. 18 and 7 in the last three games in by half or in the second half. And they blew all of them. 
they ha- I, I just think, again, they, they have a good enough, you know, I think Mahomes will try his best. I think Mahomes can play in the pocket. You know, I do think Joe Burrow will have the athleticism advantage. But I think Patrick Mahomes understands. He knows how much importance this is going to be. And I think he will, you know, da-da-da, put up his one of his better efforts. And I just think for the Chiefs, they understand the desperation they're going to have to play with. And I think if that offensive line is banged up, I do think Joe Burrow will be under much more duress. And I think the Chiefs will be playing a better defensive game at a night game in Arrowhead. And I think they, they get the redemption that they want and they rightfully, you know, get to send the Bengals home from this miracle run, you know, from this magical, no, no, magical run. And I think the Chiefs just grit out a tough home game because I just feel like the, the offensive line will have more struggles against the Chiefs. And I think the Chiefs' desperation and motivation will win out the day against the Bengals, who are, you know, going to feel confident, you know, and, you know, but it's going to be the first time weird that in this game they are the favorite. Arguably, I know the Chiefs are the betting favorite, but it's a point. But the public perception betting favorite is the Bengals. And I just have to believe the Chiefs are going to be desperate enough. They're going to play a good enough game and well enough with decision-making and, and that Mahomes will make the throws. Allen won't. And I think Mahomes, as a you know passer, will make a couple more plays of his arms that I don't think Joe Burrow will. And he won't make the mistake he did last time in overtime. And they win the game off of that. Again, I'm not going to be surprised at all if the Bengals win. In fact, I feel like if the Bengals win again, I feel like I'm that meme of Sideshow Bob walking into rakes every time I go against Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is every one of these rakes, and every time I like to step back, ah, Joe Burrow, smack me. Joe Burrow, smack me. Joe Burrow, like, every time I bet against this guy, I never can, I, you know, I, I, I don't want him. And this, you know, this will be my final one that I'll put the dagger in my, you know, betting against Joe Burrow. Uh, but I'm going to do it one last time. And I'm going to take the Chiefs because I just feel like, again, they have to win this game. Because I feel like the whole perception of Patrick Mahomes and what the Chiefs have done changes entirely with a loss on Sunday night. And Joe Burrow ascends over Patrick Mahomes if he wins Super Bowl. You know, you know if he's a two-time Super Bowl loser, he's the best, you know, he's the best quarterback to not win a Super Bowl. You could still say he's the second best quarterback in the league, but he doesn't get that mantle unless he wins a Lombardi. And I feel like a lot of people would tell you they'll win the Lombardi, regardless if it's the Eagles or the Niners, just based on the talent they have. So uh, that's all. I can't sit here minus one. I can't sit here straight up. And that is it. So until next week, where I will give my thoughts and prediction on Super Bowl 57 in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, that is it for this week. So like, comment, rate, and subscribe. Please check out the NFL YouTube Prognosticator page. There are great people like Half Moon's Picks, Bridgewater's Finest, The Blind Canadian Cat. Johnny Bretzky, uh, Fire and Brim Sports, Phil, uh, Philly Take of RB. There's a bunch of great content creators in my description. If you want to see different people giving predictions, Shiny Knife, oh, shout out him. I, I've gone on them before, and he, he does a great job. Please check all of them out. They are great people that make great content about the NFL, just like I do. And that is it. So until next week, everybody, till I give my Super Bowl 57 prediction, this is Matt the NFL Fanatic signing off. Until next time, everyone. So long.